Well, it's sort of a uh, general uh, announcement. Um, uh, I, after today's class, I think I'm probably going to need some of Tuesday as well. Uh, but anyway, so you will have the third uh, uh, problem set that will have a lot of Grossmannian stuff um, on it uh, on uh, Tuesday. I didn't uh, prepare it yet for today because I want to see exactly what we end up uh, talking about. <laughs> um, uh, another thing, uh, those of you who uh, might want to do a, a paper or something for the course, I, I promised uh, a big list of subjects and also a discussion. Um, uh, I will give a list also on Tuesday, but um, uh, aside from that, uh, both Tuesday and Thursday, like um, from, uh, let's say, 9 until class, um, I'll be there uh, in my office on the fifth floor if people want to specifically talk about um, what they want to do, okay? And, and, and we, can, uh, we can sort of tailor it for whatever you're interested in, um, uh, be it uh, uh, something small, something more ambitious, uh, whatever. But um, let's, let's do that uh, next week. Okay, so, um, <coughs> so last time we began with the, uh, we began with the physics motivation of um, ignoring virtual particles, just gluing together uh, on-shell three particle amplitudes to build more complicated uh, on-shell processes, on-shell diagrams. Um, uh, firstly, because it's an interesting sort of canonical on-shell thing to do. Uh, and secondly, because we're quickly rewarded by recognizing that what appears to be the trick of BCFW recursion relations is actually not really a trick, but is uh, uh, really directly representing an on-shell process. We haven't really talked about loops yet. I'm going to uh, be talking about loops uh, in more detail next week after we have all these things uh, uh, under our belt. But, but we got a brief look at it um, as well. It's not just uh, tree amplitudes, but actually in n equals 4 super Yang mills, all the amplitudes, the loop integrand to all loop orders is actually representable directly as these on-shell processes. So they're both uh, of uh, clear academic interest as well as less academic interest as far as really determining the amplitudes are concerned. Um, and then we saw that if we wanted to actually compute these on-shell diagrams, uh, that the naive way of doing it by integrating over the in intermediate on-shell phase space was complicated um, because of momentum conservation. <laughs> I mean, uh, if, I, if we just describe what these on-shell processes are in space-time, it's clear the sense in which they're not Feynman diagrams, right? Each one of these on-shell processes is supported on a full light cone. And if we're really tr trying to imagine it in, in the real, this is a 2-2 signature light cone. But anyway, it's something that's supported on a full light cone. And when we're gluing them together, it's not points coming together at a point in space-time. It's uh, we're, we're integrating over. Uh, all points that are separated could be null separated from each other on the support of these uh, of those of these uh, 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 on shell processes. Okay, um, uh, but uh, we are motivated uh, uh, to give a different representation of the three particle amplitudes um, in terms of these integrals over the little g one threes and the little g two threes, and doing that allowed us to plonk all the vertices down together and amalgamate them, um, do the integral over the lambda and the lambda tilde trivially, and be left with an integration over all the little g13s and the g23s associated with the black and white vertices that parametrize naturally some part, some part uh, that, that brought us a k by n matrix um, up to GLK transformations, and therefore was giving us, uh, so, uh, was parametrizing some part in a Grassmannian. Um, so we learned how to do that. We learned how to do it. Uh, uh, concretely, we saw that the uh, degrees of freedom were associated with the, uh, could be associated with the edges of the graph modulo GL1 transformations on the vertices, or more gauge invariantly with the face variables associated uh, with each graph. Uh, and we also saw that there are these canonical moves, the merge, unmerge, and the square move that uh, left the form we're integrating invariant, left the point in the Grassmannian invariant, left the form invariant. And also this bubble reduction move that helped us uh, simplify seemingly incredibly complicated diagrams, just pulling out these d logs associated with the bubbles as we go until we got to the simplest possible reduced diagrams. And so our task uh, today is to understand these reduced diagrams and understand the connection with the uh, the connection with the positive Grassmannian. And let me 
remind you that we had already had a taste for uh, the thing that was going to be involved, um, uh, a taste of what is invariant as we do the merge, unmerge, and square moves. Uh, and the thing which is an invariant is this uh, permutation that we talked about. So it's already sort of cool that we have to think about permutations and so on. We, we, we think we're doing a gluon scattering, but anyway, here we are. Um, we're forced to think about uh, uh, these interesting permutations. Okay, and so, for example, the permutation associated with this diagram, the, the left-right path permutation is 1 to 4, 2 to 6, 3 to 5, 4 to 1, which uh, I'm going to write as 7. So everything is going to be shifted. Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, every time a permutation might jump back, but I'm always going to imagine that it's going forward since these indices are cyclically ordered. Okay, so, uh, so if, if, if sigma of A uh, is equal to some... Uh, C with C less than A, I'll actually say that it's equal to C plus N. Okay, so I'm always going to have it go forward. Okay, so 4 goes to 7, uh, 5 goes to 3, which is really the same. Um, uh, sorry, 5 goes to 2, which is 8, and 6 goes to 3, which is 9. Okay, and, and we said that if we do square moves and merge on merge, we're not going to change this uh, permutation. All right, so now I'm going to, uh, uh, and um, uh, we could really spend, you know, we could spend a month or a month and a half talking about the positive Rastamanian in, in, uh, in infinite detail. Um, uh, I'm going to tell you uh, all the true statements today and give you a lot of intuition for why they're all, why they're all true. I won't prove every single one of them. Um, um, and some of them you'll do on your homework. Some of them involve some very beautiful and simple uh, kind of, not even linear algebra, but thinking about the uh, vector spaces and some of it you'll do on your homework. Okay, so I want to tell you what this permutation means. So this permutation actually has a meaning. And uh, one motivation, uh, well, one, let's, let's see what it is that, that we're after. I, um, uh, I, I told you for, a, uh, for these couple of lectures, we're going to be living in the Grassmannian. So we figured out how from these diagrams we're getting, we figured out how from these diagrams we're getting some k by n matrix C. So, so we have some 3 by 6 matrix C, C1 through C6. But this matrix depends on, this matrix depends on some number of parameters. For example, how many parameters are there in this example? What is the, uh, if you believe me that it's reduced, which it turns out to be, but how many parameters are there in this example? There are eight parameters. Um, remember, the number of parameters is the number of faces of the graph minus 1. Okay, so the number of faces of this graph are these three that we see, the 6 on the outside, so 3 plus 6 minus 1. So this thing actually depends on eight parameters, the C of alpha 1 through alpha 8. It depends on eight parameters. Um, what is the dimensionality of G36? The dimensionality of G36 is 3 times 6 minus 3 equals 9. So uh, that already tells you that this configuration of six three-dimensional vectors is not as generic as possible, right? It's not, uh, it depends on eight parameters. So I'm sort of slicing through some eight-dimensional uh, uh, part of the top-dimensional, nine-dimensional space of the whole Grassmannian. So, these vectors look like something. They satisfy some relations. Of, and what we're going to try to understand is what those relations are. Okay? So let me tell you what, first what the answer ends up being, that this permutation tells you everything you need to know about what that configuration of vectors looks like. Okay? Or everything you need to know about an aspect of uh, this configuration of vectors is go be going to be the only aspect that we care about. Um, so the, the permutation uh, A goes to sigma of A captures all the linear dependencies between 
chains of consecutive vectors C, like C, C A, C A plus 1, dot, 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 dot. So this is, a, 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 this is a, I'll make it more concrete in a second, but let me say completely specifically what this means. Sigma of A is the first column for which CA is contained in the span of CA plus 1 dot dot up to C sigma of A. Okay, so um, there's a special case if the column CA happens to vanish. If CA equals 0, then we just say that sigma of A is equal to A. All right, so this is a little abstract, so let's, uh, uh, let's uh, see what, what, what we mean by this. So let's say we're in uh, G24. Let's say we're in G24. So again, so these are four two-dimensional vectors. So we could draw them a couple of ways. Let's draw them the sort of first way, really as four two-dimensional vectors, one, two, three, four. So what this is, what this is t asking me is the following, or I could also draw this as, uh, uh, I could draw it projectively in the way that we talked about. I could also draw it like this. One, two, three, four. Remember, just by intersecting this with some line. Okay? But what is this asking me? So these vectors look generic, right? They look, the, the, they look, they look generic. So I'm asking, what is the first, as I go forward, what is the first vector such that, so, uh, such that 1 is, is contained in the span of the rest of them? Okay, so for example, 1 is obviously not contained in the span of 2. It's not proportional to 2. Okay, so I can't write 1 as a linear combination of just 2. But I can write 1 as a linear combination of 2 plus 3. Okay? So sigma of 1 is equal to 3. So it's telling me that uh, 1 can be sort of expressed in terms of the guides in front of it. That's this entire subject. Okay? That this sort of entire subject is about uh, finding consecutive linear dependencies. <laughs> Uh, which, is, which is to say, given a given vector, how is this vector situated relative to all the stack of the guys in front of it? Okay. Where situated means, well, we'll be more concrete about what it means in, in a second, but anyway, this is what the permutation is, uh, is uh, telling us. And so in this case, clearly, sigma of 2 would be 4. I just have to jump 2 ahead. Sigma of 3, I've got to go ahead. So 3 is 4. The next one over would be 1 which uh, I'm, I'm going to write as 5, and sigma 4 is 2, which I'm going to write as 6. OK? And if you recall, this is also what we get. That's the permutation that we got from this picture. Get the orientation, just one, two, three, four. And um, and last time we also saw that if I just looked at there, are, there are four variables here, right? And if I looked at what I got in G24, it was some generic configuration. We have we're not talking about positivity yet. We'll come back to positivity in a second, but you just get some uh, generic configuration of four two-dimensional vectors. OK, let's contrast that with uh, another example.
So let's say I have one and um, two and three are parallel. Okay? Then what would the, uh, the affine, this is called the affine permutation associated with the uh, decorated permutation associated with the graph. So here I'd have one goes to, one goes to, who does one go to here? One goes to four, right? Two goes to, two goes to who? It's the first guy, two goes to three, exactly. Three goes to, three goes to what? One, which is five, and four goes to two, which is six. Okay? Okay, now, um, so that's the affine permutation associated with this configuration of vectors. Now let's stare for a second at what we would have gotten from this on shell diagram, or playback graph, as Postikoff calls it. Okay, so if I label these one, two, three, four, and uh, let's just, uh, I'm just gonna decorate them. We did this example last time, but let me just write it again. So if we used our rules for uh, assigning some point in the Grassmannian associated with this guy, so I gave a perfect orientation of this graph, one in, two out, two in, one out. And so if I write down the formula, just going through the paths, okay, so for example, one, four, there's just a single path, alpha, three, beta, oops, what am I doing? Uh, uh, oh, sorry, here's one, four, yeah. One, four is just uh, alpha, one, alpha, four. Sorry, that's alpha, four. Okay. Um, and so on. Okay, so, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, one, and one, two is zero because I can't get there, and I filled in the rest of them. Okay. So, you see, what does this configuration of vectors look like? I have the vector one, vector four are generic, but two and three are parallel to each other. Okay. So that's exactly what's reflected by this uh, affine permutation. Okay? So let's do a more interesting example. So let's look at configuration in G36. So if we do G36, and first let's again do the kind of generic configuration. So this would be six generic vectors, right? Six generic three-dimensional vectors. Just in order to draw it once again, as you recall, uh, we're going to imagine splicing this with a plane and just drawing it like this. Now, I'm just drawing it to look like a convex uh, hexagon for future purposes. At this point, we have no idea, nothing to do with convexity. We don't know the word positive or convexity or anything like that. So um, it's just so natural to draw it this way when it's cyclically ordered. You can't, you can't help but do it. <laughs> but, uh, but we don't know that yet. We'll, we'll know it in a second. Okay? So. This is the generic configuration. And so what is the permutation in this case? Okay. So it's one goes to, so one is in the span of who? One is a three vector, and so one is in the span of two plus three plus four. Okay, so one goes to four, two goes to five, three goes to six, four goes to seven, five goes to eight, six goes to nine. In complete generality, there's something that we can call the top cell, or the top dimensional configuration. Okay. 
all we have n k vectors with no relations. And so the permutation is just uh, a goes to a plus k. is the affine permutation. Okay, but now let's look at a more interesting configuration. Let's say that it looks like like this. Like three and four or five are on a line. Okay, again, we don't know about positivity, but if you remember, if we were talking about boundaries of the positive Grassmannian, when we uh, just loosely defined it as a space with all the minors positive, we discovered that the first boundaries of the positive Grassmannian were when c consecutive things became, uh, uh, consecutive minors became zero. Okay, so in this case, it would be when you, you, you squash the side of the hexagon so that three things become uh, collinear. Okay, so what is the affine permutation in this case? Just to get some more practice. So one goes to who? One goes to four, right? One is a linear combination of two plus three plus four. No problem. Two goes to who? Now two is slightly more interesting. Who does two go to? Two goes, has to go all the way to six. That's yes, because uh, 3 is good, 4 is good, but 5 is not adding anything. 5 just lives on the line 3, 4, right? So writing 2 is a linear combination of 3 and 4, 5 isn't adding anything. I have to go all the way to 6. Okay, so 2 goes to 6. Okay, 3. What does 3 do? 3 is also fun. Where does 3 go? 3 goes to 5. Why does 3 go to 5? It's because, well, 3 is on the line 4, 5. So it's a linear combination of 4 plus 5. Okay? 4 goes to 1. So that's, that's not subtle. And 5 goes to 2. And 6 goes to 3. Okay, so I didn't draw this picture randomly. That configuration is this permutation, OK? And so the claim is that if you, that this is an eight-dimensional configuration of vectors. And what's special about this eight-dimensional configuration of vectors, and you would discover it if you put the edge weights in, did the boundary measurements, wrote down the matrix, you would discover what's special about this eight-dimensional configuration is what? The minor 3, 4, 5 vanishes. Okay, and so this configuration is not random, but is a configuration of these uh, of these points where three, four, five are on a line. Okay. Now, a little bit of thought, and uh, this is what I'll I'll get you to work through in some more detail on the problem set. But you see, I've given you this configuration, so this configuration seems to have like. Lots of information in it. I, I seem to have just uh, pulled out uh, a little bit of the information. Um, but you would think, well, this is a little too uh, simple. But, but you would think, uh, even if I can about, care about change of linear dependencies, that, uh, that, there's, uh, that I have to tell you a lot about what these linear dependencies are um, in order to, to reconstruct the uh, 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 you, you would think that there's a lot more information in the, in the uh, in, in the change of consecutive linear dependencies than is captured by this permutation. And in fact, there isn't. Everything is captured by this permutation. And I'll try to give you some intuition for why that's true in a second. But let me just uh, tell you, uh, again, what the, what the facts are and how to, how to use it. So, uh, so a few facts about the, this affine permutation. So this permutation is really the entire invariant content. Um, so, so we already saw that this was uh, the permutation for the uh, top cell. 
And so we've seen that, um, that uh, exactly k things jump back already in the top cell, right? Um, more generally, uh, the sum of a equals 1 to n of sigma a minus a is equal to n times k. Okay, so that's how k is reflected in this decorated permutation. And this is just a silly way. This just counts the number that jump back, right? So instead of just counting the number, if, uh, uh, in the sum, in the sigma of a's, um, the sigma of a's are just a reordering of the a's, except for the k that jump back, except for the k that you have to add n to. Okay, so that's why you get n times k. Right, so this is just uh, uh, a way of writing that. But uh, more, more, more loosely, k is the number that jump back. If we didn't call it, if we didn't insist that everything goes forward. OK. Now, here's another cool fact. Uh, the permutation also tells you the dimensionality of the cell. And that's encoded in the following uh, beautiful picture. So let me do it. This is kind of a big example, but I'll do it for this example, just so we have a slightly, uh, the example that, that we just uh, talked about. So I'm going to put here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. OK, and I'm going to just uh, draw this permutation just in the following way. I'm going to draw like 1 goes to 4, like that. So starting from 1, I'll go up to 4, and then I'll, I'll, I will and I'll cross, cross over. And I imagine this whole thing keeps, keeps going. So something was coming back. I'll just draw this picture periodically uh, 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 in all directions. Something, something came into 1, which, which we haven't talked about yet. but. We'll see in a second. So 2 goes where? 2 goes to 6. 3 went to 5. 4 went to 7. 5 went to 8. 6 went to 9. OK, and, and this picture continues this way, continues that way. So something came into 2, which I'm not going to, uh, so we could just keep continuing it in all directions. Um, but we're just going to focus on the part from 1 to 6, Okay, so one particular chunk. And And the claim is that the dimensionality of the configuration is completely captured by counting, let's say, the number of dots on each vertical line. So including the one down here. So one, two. So let's just draw all of them in this case. Oh, not that one. Sorry. Not, not these hooks up there. All of the other ones. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, so how many dots do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Uh, thank goodness. <laughs> okay, so the, so, so the number of yellow dots is 17. Did I do that right? Yes. OK. And the dimensionality of the configuration 
is equal to the number of dots minus k squared, okay, if you're in GKN. So in this case, it's the number of dots minus 9, which is equal to 8. Okay, so at least I've given you an algorithm. Now I'm going to try to explain why this algorithm is true. But, but, uh, but you give me the uh, affine permutation. It, it, it tells you, it tells you uh, it, so if you read off the permutation from the graph, um, it tells you something about the configuration of vectors associated with the matrix. Uh, the permutation is the first column to the right of any column such that it's contained in the, uh, in the span of the guys in front of it up to that point. Then if you draw this uh, associated picture, the dimensionality of the configuration is counted uh, in the way that I just told you. So now let me give you some intuition for why this is true. Oh, sorry. And the number that jumped back is, uh, is a K. OK, um, so, he, so here is, uh, he, uh, let's begin with sort of all the information that we might want. So here is all the information we might want, all the information about consecutive linear dependencies would be contained in giving the following set of numbers. So we'll call them the rank associated with A and B which is just this is just the rank of the space spanned by ca ca plus 1 up to cb okay so clearly this is all the information there is at least about the consecutive linear dependencies. I'm just telling you exactly the thing that we're sort of doing by hand in our, in our, in our pictures there. Um, OK. And it's actually going to be convenient to arrange this uh, set of information in a table uh, as follows. So I'll start with down here with the rank of 1, 1, then the rank of 1, 2, rank of 1, 3, and so on. I can, in principle, keep on going infinitely, um, because this rank is going to top off at k eventually. Whatever k is, uh, the, oh, I just have k-dimensional vectors. So if I start with a vector that isn't 0, it'll, the, the rank of, of r11 will be 1. Then maybe the next one might grow, it might not grow, it might go to 1, 2, and so on. So these numbers are strictly non they're either staying the same or increasing as I go up. OK, and eventually they, they hit k, and they can't get big, bigger than, uh, they can't get bigger than k. OK? Um, but it's going to be convenient to arrange them in the following way. So I'm going to make that uh, table. Let's see what this table looks like for our. Uh, let's see what this table looks like for our example. So for example, that was three, four, five, six, one, two. What does this table look like? I'm going to sort of put them in little boxes here. Okay, so here's the first box. Box is a little too big. But anyway, this is going to be R11. So what is R11? Is 1. What is R12? Is 2. It got bigger. R13 is 3. And then that's it. Then we're done. 3, 3. Three. Okay. 
Okay, so let's go to the next one over. Okay, what about uh, R22 is 1, R23 is 2, R24 is 3, so it's still not too exciting, so let's go to the next one. All right, now R33, this is now going to start being more interesting. That's 1. What's R34? 2. But what's R35? It's still 2. And then it becomes 3, 3, 3. I'm not going to need them up there, but just to emphasize that we can keep going. OK. And uh, let me just do one more. Doesn't really, we, we won't complete. I guess we could complete all of them if we liked. So um, R44 is 1, R45 is 2, uh, 3, 3, 3, 3. Okay. Now, so this table is um, all the information that we want about what the chains of consecutive linear dependencies are. Okay, but, and it has various obvious properties. It's increasing in this direction, non-decreasing in this direction. It's uh, decreasing in that direction. Um, and a little bit of thought, this is what I'll ask you to do on your problem set, but a little bit of thought actually shows that you can entirely reproduce this table uh, from much less information. Okay? And in fact, um, if I go at the border between you know, any one of these lines, there's actually a unique point. So going, moving up along any one of these lines. So. So if this is A, so what, what I mean here, so this, is, uh, this was associated with 1, so I'm going to label that line to be line 1. Okay, that line is going to be line 1. I'll label this line to be line 2, this line to be line 3, and so on. Okay? There's a unique point that locally looks like this. So A coming in here, out, out here is uh, some sigma of A, I won't put arrows here, but this table looks like R, 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 and R minus 1. Okay? But let's see how it works. Uh, let's see how it works in this example. For example, in column 1, Oh, sorry, with point one, um, I want to see where here does it locally look like r, 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 r minus one? It looks like that here, right? So I put one, and then out it goes, right? So that's that one to four. Two, where does it locally look like that? It locally looks like that up here, three, 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 two. So that's 2 goes to 6. 3 locally looks like that here. OK, and that's how I reconstruct the permutation from this picture. The claim is that if you know the permutation, if you know where it locally looks like r, 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 r minus 1, you can completely reconstruct all the other 
numbers of the boxes. Okay? So that's what entirely fixes the sort of content of the consecutive linear dependencies in the uh, problem. Okay? Um, Now this also makes it intuitive uh, why we have the formula for why we have the formula for the dimensionality of the space. Let's think about it already in the top cell case, right? In the top cell case, for the top cell, um, remember we have a goes to a plus k. So you want to give the, you know, all the information there is about this configuration of vectors. And that's telling you that to tell you something about where A is situated with respect to all the guys in front of it, I should give you k numbers, right? Because, uh, because in this case, the rank of A and sigma of A is just equal to k. Right? That's just saying I have to give you uh, that, that that set of numbers is uh, k dimensional. OK, and so, so naively, I'm specifying k times, I have k times n degrees of freedom in order to specify what the entire configuration looks like. But of course, there's the minus k squared redundancy from the GLK. And so that gives me k times n minus k, which is the, uh, the correct dimensionality of the, of the Grassmannian itself. So the same intuition is true in general. So intuitively, and it's true, the number of degrees of freedom that you need to specify such a configuration is exactly the sum over a equals 1 to n of the ranks from a to sigma of a minus k squared. OK? But that number of the ranks of a from sigma of a is exactly the number of dots <laughs> that you encounter along the vertical direction, or the horizontal direction for that matter. But okay. So this is the same. So you could either you could either use this formula or this is the same as the number of dots uh, on a vertical line on the vertical line. In, in that dimension graph. OK. So, so the affine permutation tells us everything about the consecutive linear dependencies of the, uh, of the, of the configuration of vectors that we got. Um, uh, because of this fact that we can sort of read off this entire table just from the information of what, where it locally looks looks like that. Um, it, it tells us k, it tells us the everything about the consecutive linear dependencies, and it tells us the dimensionality of the configuration. Now actually right here we can give, there's a number of tests that we could uh, give, but this is, a, this is a simple one. We could give a test for whether a graph is reduced or not. Okay, so here's the test. Take your uh, take the graph, look at its permutation, compute its ersatz dimension in this way, and check if that dimension agrees with the number of faces of the graph. <laughs> if it doesn't agree with the number of faces of the graph, it's not reduced. The number of faces minus one. Okay. There are other tests, but that's a, that's a quite simple and uh, practical one. Okay, 
Uh, any questions about this? At least I've just I've made a, a bunch of claims. I hope I've made some of them uh, intuitive. But um, so far, you should understand that, that, uh, that uh, everything about what the configuration of vectors look like that we get from these platelet graphs or these onshell diagrams is entirely captured by this, uh, uh, by this permutation. All right. Now I want to talk about how we can build up, now, now that we're thinking about permutations, and I, I said this uh, quickly last time, we're used to the idea that you can represent a permutation, an ordinary permutation, So let's say we have a uh, we have a, a boring permutation, a, a non-affine permutation. Then we can represent these permutations. We're used to the fact that we can represent them graphically, like one goes to four, two goes to five, three goes to one, four goes to two, and let's say five goes to three. And that when we do that, it all of a sudden looks like a picture of a scattering process in time and space. And that, um, in fact, that picture, if I think in terms of time evolution, and I just imagine as I go up in time, which interaction do I see first, uh, that gives me a way of decomposing the permutation into a product of adjacent transpositions. So that's a standard fact. We can reduce the, we can break up a permutation into uh, adjacent transpositions. And we can do it in lots and lots of different ways because there's lots of ways of drawing this picture. And in fact, if you demand that uh, the only, so let's say you're actually associating some, some little S matrices in one plus one dimensions with each one of these basic two to two scattering processes. If you want to demand that the physics only cares about the permutation and nothing else, you have to demand this famous formula, okay, that it doesn't matter the order in which these things cross. This is the Yang-Baxter equation, and it's associated with the whole theory of integrable systems in one plus one dimensions. Okay, but so this is a this is a very very old example of how uh, something very simple and combinatorial like a permutation, uh, just representing it pictorially, turns it into a picture of a scattering process, and. In, in fact, in order for the scattering process to, to be not have more information than the permutation, you have to have very special kind of theories that are integrable, um, and uh, and we have to have this kind of uh, relation. Okay, but we already have the sort of picture that we're building up the more complicated permutation by gluing together basic a basic process, this basic adjacent transposition, which is uh, reflected uh, physically in terms of the two to two scattering. Amplitude. Okay, and now we're going to do the same thing, except with our permutations, which are these decorated permutations, where k of them jump back. And to begin with, before getting to the details, uh, let's just see what should an adjacent transposition be for our decorated permutations. which we're representing with these uh, uh, on-shell diagrams or these playbook graphs. Um, let's say you already have a graph that's associated with a certain permutation. Say A goes to sigma of A and B goes to sigma of B. Oh, sorry, a and a, I want to do something adjacent, I apologize. So I have a and a plus one. So here I have some sigma, uh, let's say sigma of a and sigma of a plus one. 
then how do I make an adjacent transposition happen? Just pictorially, I put a white vertex here and a black vertex there. Okay. So let's see why that affects an adjacent transposition. Well, whoever's coming out of A, I'm going to have to turn left and then right. And so it goes into whoever was the image of A plus 1. Similarly, whoever's coming out of A plus 1, I'll have to turn right and then left, and it goes into sigma of A. It's exactly swapping A and A plus 1. On the other hand, anything that was going into A plus 1 here is going to just keep making a right turn. So it'll still go to A plus 1. Everyone that was going into A will still go into A, and I'm not changing anything else. Okay, so all this little bridge does is swap A and A plus 1. So, and this, of course, is exactly the BCFW bridge. And if I associated some edge parameter alpha here, then what this does at the level of the matrix uh, is very easy to see. And um, it, it shifts CA plus 1, goes to CA plus 1, plus alpha times CA. So it shifts A plus 1 by something proportional to this new variable that you've added alpha times CA. We uh, didn't, haven't uh, seen this super explicitly, but uh, it's, tri it's trivial to see from what I told you about boundary measurements uh, last time. And also, it's very natural. This is also what was going on in terms of the lambdas and lambda tildes, if you remember, right? We're shifting a lambda by the, by the, by the adjacent uh, uh, lambda and vice versa for the lambda tilde. Okay, so that, that's just doing this linear shift. Okay, so that's what adjacent transpositions are going to be. So now we have to learn um, what uh, trivial permutations are, and then figure out how to just add, do adjacent transpositions to build up, uh, to build up uh, general uh, permutations from the simple one. All right. So now it's clear that what what we should mean by trivial permutation. These should correspond to cells that have no degrees of freedom, zero-dimensional cells. And that, in turn, should mean like some matrix with a bunch of ones and zeros, with, with, with the k by k identity block, some k by day identity block, and the rest zero everywhere else. So I can put the k by k identity block anywhere I like, in some columns, wherever I like, and everyone else is going to be 0. Okay, so let's say, uh, what would a zero-dimensional cell of G36 look like? Ah, uh, zero cell of G36 would look like, let's say, Use one that I like. Well, I actually won't use this one again. So they don't have to be consecutive or anything. Just, just some zero-dimensional cell. Okay. Now, what are the affine? What's the affine permutation associated with this guy? Well, like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So clearly, we're going to have 2 goes, we, we said that when it's 0, 2 is going to go to 2, 5 goes to 5, and 6 goes to 6. So what do the other guys have to be? So the other guys are also, uh, uh, so in order to, the only, well, what is it in, in the picture, right? So 1 just has to go all the way back and come back to itself, right? So 1 goes to seven, and so on, right? Three goes to nine, and four 
uh, goes to tech. And we want to uh, represent these guys also by on-shell diagrams or by playback graphs. Okay. So to do this, we're going to introduce some funny notation of the lollipop diagrams. Okay. So um, every graph, every graph, uh, uh, every column. Which is, uh, uh, which is mapped to itself plus n, every non-vanishing column will be represented by a white lollipop. So here I'd have one. And the other ones that are vanishing are represented by a black poly polypop, lollipop. <laughs> And the intuition is that if you do a left-right path, if you turn left at the, on the, at the white lollipop vertex or right at the light, at the blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I don't know why I can't say the word lollipop today. Uh, I guess I'm not used to saying it. Um, um, lollipop, lollipop, lollipop. Good. Um, yeah, that if you turn right and left, uh, then you would actually get this, uh, this uh, permutation. Okay? But, so it's a kind of a degenerate thing, but it's uh, OK. OK, and now, um, so now we're going to start with the, from these guys and just start adding bridges. We're going to start adding bridges and build more, more complicated configurations. Um, there's, but it's possible that as, as you're adding a bridge, you're not, what, what we want to do is every bridge, so this has no degrees of freedom, and we want to add every bridge should add one degree of freedom as we go, the alpha associated with the bridge. And we'll even know the matrix that we're building up as we go, because I'm shifting the column, right? So I start with this matrix, I add a bridge, I get a new matrix, and I know which one I, I got, and I just sort of keep going iteratively like that. I just have to make sure, though, that, uh, that I'm actually adding a degree of freedom. So in other words, it's possible if you add a bridge that you don't uh, still have a reduced diagram. So here's a very simple example we actually sort of run into uh, early on when we sort of play uh, BCFW type games. Let's say I have a picture like this. And I want to add a bridge here, okay? a white-black bridge here. Well, if I add a white-black bridge here, this graph is not reduced. Okay? I didn't actually add any degrees of freedom. Why? Because I can merge and unmerge these guys, and I just uh, I've made a bubble on the inside. OK? So this is not good. I want to make sure when I'm adding bridges that this does not happen. OK, and it's actually another easy exercise uh, to see that, uh, that if I add a bridge, adding a bridge adds a degree of freedom, or keeps the graph reduced, keeps the diagram reduced. If, when I'm adding a bridge between A and A plus 1, sigma of A is actually bigger than sigma of A plus 1. So it's like, actually, the way I drew the, uh, the picture. So I drew the picture. It was not random to draw it that way. So I, we had a and a plus 1, and a went this way, and a plus 1 went that way. Okay, so sigma of a should be bigger than sigma of a plus 1. And you can see that that's what's wrong in this example. Okay. In this example, you're adding a bridge to something where it was the other way around. And that's the only rule. 
Okay? So if you do that, it's guaranteed as you go that the graph that you get is going to stay reduced. Yes? Yes, and I'm just coming uh, for a moment to what, uh, what, uh, what consecutive uh, means in general. Okay, so let me put this a plus one in quotes. Okay. So the other thing that can happen, and this is especially true near the bottom with these very degenerate uh, uh, configurations, um, uh, the most obvious thing is that um, let's say you have some column and it's, a, it, its next column over is zero. Okay, then this bridge is not doing anything. <laughs> I'm just multiplying, I'm adding something times zero. So that's clearly not keeping the uh, graph reduced. Okay. More generally, this is uh, wh what I mean by a plus one. So a set a, a plus one, a plus one and a can be separated by any number of b's which are mapped to themselves under the permutation, either themselves or themselves plus n. Okay. So a and a plus 1 can be separated by any number of b's for which sigma of b is either equal to b or b plus n. And that's it. Okay, so you can't use any of those. Uh, yeah. Sorry? No, they have to be consecutive. So in this case, this is not one of those things. Yeah. No, we're, we're, we're going to come to these pictures. In, we're we're, we're, we're going to do an example in a second. OK. All right. So, um, so in this way, you, you have a whole stack of, of ways, in principle, of starting from, and you don't even have to draw a picture if you don't like, right? You can just, and we'll, we'll, we'll even just uh, do it just uh, plonking down matrices too, but it's fun to draw the uh, pictures as well. You start from any zero dimensional cell, and then you find anywhere you can add a bridge compatible with these rules, and you keep going. Okay? And, uh, and then you'll eventually hit the top, and you're done. Um, now, we can also say this rule backwards. So let's say, uh, let's say someone hands you a permutation, and you want to know how to decompose it into adjacent transposition. So if I want to go backwards, um, so if, if I have a to sigma of a, and I want to decompose, I, I want to give a bridge decomposition, then there, there are many ways of, again, there are many ways of doing it, but there are sort of one, uh, th this one is just one canonical one, a very simple one uh, to state, just, just to build one. In other words, there are many places in principle you can add bridges. This is just a choice, a particular, uh, a particular simple choice, um, which is to find the first, so people say it's lexicographically first, But what that just means in practice is that you, you start from 1, 2, whatever the very, very first index is for A, such that you can find a B or an A plus 1 that uh, satisfies these, these rules. So you want to find the first uh, A. Um, uh, uh, such that, so the smallest A, such that there exists a C. So a less than c, and sigma a less than sigma c, 
okay, where A and C can be separated by any B's with sigma of B equal to B or B plus N. So here I'm trying to go backwards. So here, in order to add a bridge, I have to have that sigma of A is bigger than sigma of A plus 1. So to go backwards, I have to have that sigma of A is smaller than sigma of C. All right. And actually, let me do a, uh, let me do a kind of juicy example instead of a, just a, a, very, a very small one, but just so you get an idea how you can get how these pictures would work. So let's take our, our, our permutation here again. So here is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. OK, and so I'm saying just where it goes. OK, and now I'm going to do this decomposition, right? So what we're going to do is go through this picture, uh, go, go through this line, and find the first place at which um, uh, sigma of A is less than sigma of C. And the first place that that's possible, we will invert them. Okay? So for example, the first place this happens is that 1, 2. OK? So here, my bridge is 1, 2. So I'm recording what I've done in between. So now I have 6, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9. I think I should write slightly smaller. OK. Next, what's the next place, the next first place where sigma of A is smaller than sigma of B? It's at 2 and 3. OK, so now I'll put 2, 3. OK, next it can happen at 3 and 4. And already here, something interesting has happened. What, what interesting thing has happened already at this point? 4 is now gone to 4. Right? So now 4 is out of commission. <laughs> you can't touch 4 anymore. I'm never going to use 4 anymore. Okay? What that means, at this point, 4 is a vanishing column. OK. okay. So next I have, uh, the next one is 2, 3. So 4 I'm not touching. OK, the next one is 1, 2. Oops, I don't know why I circled this 9. And now 1 has gone to itself. So now 1 is out of commission. OK, so what can I do next? So the next thing is, uh, Four is out of commission. So the next thing I can do is three, five. <laughs> now I'm allowed to jump over four. <laughs> okay. So now I have three, five. So let me write down what I get here after doing three, five. And so now what I'm going to have is uh, seven, seven, six, eight, four, five, nine. 
Now 5 is out of commission. So in the next step, I can do 2, 3. There are the first ones. So this now gives me 7, 8, 6, 4, 5, 9. So now things are getting pretty dire. The 7 is out of commission. This guy's out of commission. Uh, oh, sorry. 7, 8, 4, 5 are out of commission. So the last thing I can do is 3, 6. And so I'm left with 7, 8, 9, 4, 5, 6. And everyone's out of commission. OK? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, well, so, so that, that's just what I'm going to show now. OK, so what, what, what I did is just uh, first go the other way. So I started with the permutation I'm trying to get, and I showed how to write as a bunch of adjacent transpositions down to this, which is now a trivial matrix. And now we're just going to go through this process backwards. Okay, we're just going to add all these things backwards and see what it looks like. Okay. All right, so okay, so um, so what is the starting? So now we're starting here. So what does this look like? One, two, and three are the identity block and everyone else is zero. Okay, so so my matrix. So I'm going to keep a, a running some running diagrams here. Okay, so there's a matrix and and a diagram. So and here is my diagram. Three lolly pops. Okay, and the first bridge I'm going to add is 3, 6. So first, what does that mean at the level of the matrix? This is actually what, what sort of really matters. Uh, I, I, I should say that um, uh, Jake Bergeli back there has a fantastic package, uh, Mathematica package, that does everything you want to do with uh, the positive Grassmannian. The cells of the positive Grassmannian draws the pictures, produces the matrices, everything in the world you might want to do with it. So I, I encourage you to download it and uh, play with it you, if you want. Um, uh, OK, but the first thing we're doing, so when, when, I, when I add this bridge, um, I'm shifting the column 6 goes to 6 plus something times 3. OK, so good. I've made, this, I've made this matrix a little bit more interesting. So I've put some element down here. Let me call it alpha 1 because I did it in the first step. Actually, let me call it alpha 3. Well, no, let me call it alpha 1 since I did it in the, in the first step. Now, what do I do in this picture? So here I have, I have 3 and 6. And so I'm adding a white vertex here and a black vertex there. All right, but um, actually, there are some of these rules that are so trivial that I didn't say them when they came up before, but I should say them now. If you have a line just with a black vertex in the middle, you can remove it. If you have a line with a white vertex in the middle, you can remove it. And you can snip off dangling lollipops that just connect to internal lines. Okay, those are very, very simple uh, to show. But in this case, what that means is that uh, you can think of that as a special case of the merge-unmerge operation. Right? I can merge this white guy with that guy, and then I have just one guy on the line, and I can get, get rid of it. The upshot of all of that is adding this bridge. It's just giving me a line, a line between 3 and 6. So that's what happens in the first step. All right. What happens in the second step? I have 2, 3. Okay, so it means that first at the level of the matrix, I'm going to shift 
uh, C3 goes to C3 plus something times C2. Okay, so that's good. Now I'm going to make this slightly more interesting. So this is some alpha 2. And uh, what, I, what, I, what have I done here? I add a bridge between uh, 2 and 3. So it's like, again, I put a white vertex here, a black vertex there. I connect them. Once again, this dangling thing is irrelevant. Once again, that white thing on the inside, I can remove. And so really what I've done is just add this black vertex here. OK? Next, 3, 5. OK? Uh, 3, 5, what am I doing to the matrix? I'm shifting uh, 5 goes to 5 plus something times 3. So it's already slightly more interesting, right? I have something a little nonlinear non, non here now. I'm going to have alpha 2, alpha 3, and alpha 3. OK? And so what are we doing? In the picture, uh, now I'm adding, I'm doing 3, 5, so I'm adding a white vertex here, a black vertex here. Once again, I erase this guy. Okay, so all I've done is do that. Okay, it's starting to get a little cooler looking. Um, Let's now add, uh, the next thing we're supposed to do is add, is do 1, 2. Okay, so what is 1, one 2 doing at the level of the matrix? Um, so 2 goes to 2 plus something times 1. So I'm putting up here some alpha 4. And I added a white vertex, black vertex, dot, 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 dot. Da, 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 da. Okay, then 2, 3. Okay. And now really some fun stuff is, is starting to happen now, right? Because when I do 2, 3, I'm shifting this goes to this plus alpha 5 times that. So down here, um, uh, so up here I'm going to get alpha 4, alpha 5. Here I'm going to get alpha 2 plus alpha 5. And here it's going to still be 1. <coughs> okay, so you see the matrix is getting cooler as we, as we, uh, as we go along. Um, and I added, uh, that was a 2, 3 bridge. Okay, unfortunately I've drawn it so all the action is happening up here. <laughs> now that's going to be problematic <laughs> in a little while. Okay. Yeah, that's going to suck. Uh, okay. Well, all right. Um, it's not going to suck right now. N next, we do 3, 4. It is going to suck right now. Okay, and so on. I, I don't think I have to keep doing it over and over again, but now this whole thing is going to be some alpha 6 multiplied by what we just saw here. Alpha 6, alpha 4, alpha 5. Alpha 6 times alpha 2 plus alpha 5. And alpha 6. Okay, and so on. So I only have two steps to go, but because I don't want to keep filling in <laughs> the uh, junk up there. Uh, by the time you're done... Um, Uh, you get a uh, you get a picture that looks like this. So this is the final result. But I think it should be pretty clear that uh, how we start getting uh, the sort of rich kind of pictures that we've been we've been seeing. So we get something with these uh, nice pentagons on the inside. Okay. So you get a picture that looks like this. 
Okay, and this is exactly um, uh, well. So this this represents that permutation, and it doesn't look like that, but it's a, some square moves and merge on merge uh, away from that. Okay. As I said, this is just a particular way of doing a bridge decomposition because we've just asked the first thing you see, bridge. You don't have to. There are other things you could bridge along the way. This is just one canonical way of doing things to always produce, uh, to always produce a result. And as you see, as we go along, we can just, we're just uh, iteratively building the matrix uh, as we go. All right. Let me just say a couple of things. I didn't get the positivity today. We'll do it, uh, we'll do it uh, tomorrow. But I just wanted to, to show you one of these pictures for how this actually works. But uh, let me uh, say that, for example, everything to do with BCFW recursion can now be phrased purely as a statement about permutations. I don't even have to draw the pictures. Okay, so let's uh, let's do a couple of examples. Um, of some of the things that we did before. So, uh, but yeah. Uh, that's right. That's right. So we added one more bridge. You would get the full nine nine cell. Okay, exactly. Okay. So, so, uh, so BCFW is about. It's a very nice, simple way of making new permutations out of old ones. So, uh, first of all, let's say just inductively, you have managed to compute the lower point amplitudes or pieces of the, uh, or some on shell diagram for pieces of the lower point amplitude, it doesn't matter. Uh, then whatever we are doing, I'm going to draw this picture. And I don't even need to, I mean, I could, but I don't need to fill in the inside with the playback graph if I, if I don't like. Just inductively, this is telling me a, a way to do a permutation here. This is telling me a way to do a permutation there. And so this tells, me how to, this tells me how to make a new permutation out of jamming together the two old ones. How do I do it? Well, everything in here either goes out somewhere else or it goes into there. If it goes into there, just follow it out to where it goes into there, and you're done. And vice versa. OK? So for instance, let's see how we can uh, understand the MHV amplitudes. Okay, so uh, we had uh, at four points, this is just trivial. Okay, so at four points, at four points, we got this thing, and the permutation is one to three, two to four, three to one, four to two. I'll write it like this uh, um, because uh, at, at the very end, we can write it. Uh, to, uh, to go forward if we like. But again, this is what it is directly at the level of the uh, permutation. So I don't have to draw the inside of this picture. I mean, this is just one way of representing this permutation. This is nothing other than the k equals 2 graph. That's all. Right? So that's, that's really what it is. Just the k equals 2 top cell. And so what, what do we get from BCFW? If we want to do MHV, if we want to stick with k equals 2, then BCFW tells us that, uh, let's say inductively, um, well, let's, let's, let's do the next, next case. So let's say I'm at k equals 2, 4 point. But what I'm supposed to do is attach it to a k equals 1, 5 point and, uh, and draw a picture like this. So let's say this is, uh, I don't know, 5, 1, Yeah, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm supposed to do this and draw my bridge. OK, but what, what permutation am I getting? Well, like from, from this side. Let's, let's start from, uh, well, let's start from any side. So from 1, so 1 goes to, well, 1 goes to, uh, I have to make a right and then a left. So, so 1 is going to go to wherever 5 went. But now 5 is in this k equals 2 thing. So 5 is going to go to 5 plus 2 in this direction. So 1 will go to 3. 
Okay? Is that clear? Because on this side, you're just going to itself plus 2. Right? So 1 goes to 3. 2, what does 2 do? 2 is k equals 1. Right? So 2 just wants to go to the next guy over, which is this intermediate one. And then where is this guy going to go? This guy goes to 4. Three, well, it just goes to five, and this goes in and just makes the same left to go out. Right? So four and so on. Okay, so four will go to uh, 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 four will go to what? Right? Because if four is gonna go two, it's gonna go up that way, and it's gonna do k equals one. So it'll go up up that way, up and right. Four goes to one, and five goes to two. Okay, so this is nothing other than the top cell for G25. <laughs> okay, so this is just everyone to everyone plus two. Okay, so this is just the top cell of G25. And that's in general true for MHV. Okay, for any uh, for any uh, for any k, if you take k equals two whatever it is, and you attach it to, uh, and we attach it to the k equals 1 black vertex, so that's k equals 1, and we do it like n, n plus 1, let's say I do it like this, 1, 2, blah, blah, then Okay, then it's very easy to show that that bridge just still gives me the one higher uh, k equals to top cell. So I, I get from g to n top cell. So I get the g to n plus one top cell from here. Okay, so that's just the statement that all we get is Park Taylor over and over again. Um, and I'll just uh, write this one down, and then we'll leave uh, the class to Matt. Uh, if we look at the terms that contribute to BCFW at six point, again, I'm, I'm drawing it this way to stress we don't even have to fill in the pictures once we know what all the permutations are. It's just, just a matter of following, of gluing these permutations together. Okay, so this is one of the pieces where this is a k, this is a white vertex, so it's a k equals two vertex, and this is uh, k equals two, five point. That's one of the terms. Okay, so here I'm putting the bridge on five and six. Um, here is another term, the diagram we've been looking at most of the class, k equals two, and. This is k equals 3 and k equals 1. Okay, so these are the three terms in BCFW. Okay, and we can work out there are, there are permutations. That, so let's just work out this one. We, we've done the other one already. That's just the picture we had. But if we just do this one, 1 goes to 3. So 1 is k equals 2. 2 goes to this guy, but that guy is k equals 2. So it's going to go over to this guy, so it'll go up there and go to 5. So 2 goes to 5. 3 is k equals 2, so it hops up to there, goes there, makes a right turn. 3 goes to 6. 4, k equals 2, so it goes over here. So it hops over 2 and goes to 1, which is 7. 5 goes to, <coughs> five goes to 2. Um, which is 8, and 6 goes to 4, which is 10. OK, and so we, we just read that off from, from the picture, and we're done. right? We know the permutation. We, we know how to break it back down into adjacent transpositions. So we know how to rebuild it back up in terms of those matrices. And that's it. That's, that's, that's the answer. Um, uh, uh, from this picture, you can then very easily see that this guy, if, if this permutation is sigma, this is 
sigma, where i is shifted by i plus 2, as I've said a few times. And this is the same as sigma, where i is shifted by i plus 4. So even this equivalence between the different pictures, <laughs> we just see, we see the, the uh, permutations. And in fact, we can, uh, um, we can both manually see that they're identical. There are many other ways of seeing that they're just relabelings of, uh, of, of the same thing. But what I want to stress is that even just putting each term in BCFW, uh, as you're doing the computation, you don't even necessarily need to keep track of what you're doing along the way. You're just gluing these permutations together until you're done, and then you're done. All right, sorry, now I am done. Thanks. <laughs> sorry, Matt.